And let's pray. Wow, it's dark in here. <laughs> hey, can you uh, get your snare? Thank you. I'll be vibrating all night, <laughs> all day. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we are so blessed to come together on this rainy day ah, to worship you, to have quantity of fellowship with one another, and God, to hear from you in your word. So God, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we made it to Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 33. And how many of you went to Sunday school? Okay, you know the song. Uh, you probably remember it. Today we're going to talk about this little light of mine. <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And you know the rest of it. Hide it under a bushel. Oh, no way. I'm going to let it shine. So we've got our little light. And the wax is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I hope I can light it. Brian might have to come up and do it. I can't see it. Oh, there we go. There we go. Oh, we've got a light. Yay. <laughs> and God said, let there be light. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, how many of you remember that song, This Little Light of Mine? Okay, pretty much all of you. All right. So, today we're going to dive into the text, Luke chapter 11, verse 33. No one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar or under a basket, but on a lampstand or stool, <laughs> so that all who enter may see the light. A little science about light. How many of you have ever studied physics? Yeah? Okay. All right. So uh, light, we know white light, when it goes through a prism, is broken down into the various wavelengths, which really represent colors. And so red is the slowest and purple is the fastest. And so that's how a prism can break light into the colors of a rainbow. And that's how raindrops actually make a rainbow. Light we see is made up of all colors of the spectrum. So it's interesting. White light is all the colors put together. Black is the absence of all color. It doesn't reflect any light. And so it's simply electromagnetic uh, radiation. And so all of these are part of electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves, television waves, microwaves, uh, infrared spectrum, which we can't see any of that, but we can feel it. Especially infrared, that's the heat we feel. Uh, then we have the visible spectrum, which is just from the red to the violet or purple. And then we have ultraviolet that can be absorbed in the skin. It's used in fluorescent bulbs, x-rays, gamma rays, and some really bad stuff. But it's all the same thing. It's all electromagnetic radiation. Light is that and can travel from one point in space to another without any physical link or medium to flow through, which is kind of interesting because waves require a medium to flow through. Kind of like if you see ripples on a water, okay, those are waves and it requires water, but light that functions as waves and particles does not need a medium. It can go from one point to the other without anything. The James Webb Telescope has captured light for the furthest star ever seen. Did you guys get the news on that? So they just started using that, and that star is called Irendil. And by the way, they got that from uh, Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings uh, series. He was a sailor. He was a navigator. So this star is the furthest star we have ever seen. It's 28 billion light years away. Now, that's a long ways. 
I mean, 28 billion. How far is that? Well, light from the moon takes about one second to reach the earth. That's pretty quick. Light from the sun takes about how long? Who knows? I know John's, what is it? Eight minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> so light from the sun, when, it, when those beams shine, it only takes eight minutes to get to us. Kind of interesting. Light from the star Rendell takes 28 billion years to reach the earth, which is crazy. So light is still a puzzle to scientists. It behaves like a wave and a particle. Light is a mixture of all the colors we see. And when we see something white, like my shirt, under my black shirt, that is reflecting all the colors of the spectrum. So if there were a prism, you would see all the colors broken down because it breaks it down into the waves. But white reflects everything. Black, on the other hand, absorbs all light and reflects nothing. Okay, so black is black. By the way, the blackest black that they've made is used on satellites and some telescopes. And it is so black that if you painted a, a little dot of that black that's so black here, it would look like a hole in, in the wood because it literally would absorb everything coming in. It wouldn't look like black paint on here. It would look like there was a hole right, right in the wood. It's so black. God is light. Now, that's amazing to me because a lot of people say in Genesis, when God said, let there be light, that that's when light was created. However, God is light. In fact, he, he dwells in unapproachable light. So there was light in eternity before creation in heaven, God's dwelling place. There were candles in heaven, like this one here, God's dwelling place, before the world and the universe was ever created. So when he said, let there be light, he simply brought in what was already there from heaven into this natural creation which was complete blackness and utter darkness. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light. Oh, there we go. Hey, we're back. Hallelujah. We've got it. <laughs> so God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So we have come to equate light with good and darkness with bad. But it's interesting, most children get afraid when? When it's dark. Oh, yeah, if you've ever been. Check. Okay, we just have to turn off the, hello, my friends, hello. Okay, the FX, yes. Okay. All right, so, and Jesus is light as well. So, yeah, just turn the FX off. 
There are those. Check, check. Which number am I? I think I'm this one. Yeah. Oh, there you, there you go. Thank you. And Jesus spoke to them, saying, John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And light is so imperative for life on this planet. All the plants do what with light? Photo, photosynthesis. Yeah, they convert light. Uh, we have solar panels that do kind of the same thing now. But light is imperative for all of life, both spiritually and physically. God is light. Jesus is light. And we now have become lights to the world, reflecting God's love and grace to a lost and hurting world. Do me a favor. Let's do this. Close your eyes and put the palm of your hands over your eyes. Try to block out. Imagine being blind. You can open them again. And that's how you live your life. Complete darkness. Without any light. And folks, those people in the world that just practice sin, that ignore God, are filled with darkness. And the only glimmer of light they get is in the drugs or alcohol or whatever they do in the world. And it's just a glimmer, a, a, a thing. But when we are born again, we become children of light. Spiritual light. In the blackness, we see nothing. Open your eyes, you can see beauty because of the light. So back to our text, Luke 11, verse 34. The eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. And we just experienced that, right? It's like all you see is blackness and darkness. But do you ever see, like, lights in, in, when you do that? Like, like you see something or it's like, man, as a kid, I would want to close my eyes and then try to see stuff. <laughs> in the spirit, maybe visions, I don't know, verse 35, then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. For if therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark parts in it, you will be wholly illumined. And when the lamp illumines you with its rays, I love that. And by the way, science discovered light does move in beams or rays, except incandescent bulbs and fluorescent bulbs, it's confused light. It's just going every direction. But typically, light moves in rays. So if you've ever seen a sunset or sunrise where there's clouds and the rays of the sun coming through, it's, it's quite beautiful. So we need physical and spiritual light. We perceive everything with our eyes. And with our spiritual eyes, uh, we have discernment as to right and wrong, as to who God is. We can't allow darkness at all. Light dispels darkness. So if we are light, there won't be darkness. Now, we will get those occasional darts from the enemy. You ever get those, those weird thoughts? They're dark sometimes. It's like all of a sudden it's like, whoa, why did I just think that? Lord, take that thought captive. Uh, man, get that out of here. That's, and we should be abhorred by the darkness and drawn to the light. By the way, do you know why moths circle lights out there? Sometimes they die doing it. They keep going to the, the light. Scientists didn't know, but they just found out. So they use the sun and the moon insects to navigate as they fly. And so they keep the light here, and as they're flying it, it the sun or the moon stays up there. When there's a light bulb, they turn and they the, they keep the light to their back, so they circle it, and they just keep going around and around and around. So it's how they navigate to the light. So we live in a world that bombards us with distractions, temptations, false teachings. It's easy to become ensnared by the darkness that surrounds us. And folks, the world is getting darker every day, but as followers of Christ, we're called to be different. We're called to shine forth the light 
and love of God to a lost and hurting world to be beacons of light in a lost and dark world. Sailors back in the day, and probably in Jesus' day, when Paul traveled by sailboat all over, would use stars to navigate. And the interesting thing is, once you see that star, you have the right compass heading, that's how modern sailors still navigate. They will watch the star, not stare at their compass, because that star is going to be a constant. But planets, I don't know if you remember when we talked about false teachers and they called them wandering stars. Well, those are planets. You can't navigate by a planet because sometimes they go backwards. Sometimes they, they do different things, but stars you can. That beam of light, and that is the word of God to us. It is what? A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And that's why we study God's word so carefully. And try to be obedient to it. Light is goodness, righteousness, and truth. Ephesians 5.8. For you were formerly darkness. That represents the world. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And we broke that down a few weeks ago. Uh, Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So how do we shine our lights? Number one, three things. Hearing the word of God allows us to shine our light. Psalm 119, 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Obeying God's word. So we hear it. We then have to obey it. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your what? What does it say up there? Good works. That's obedience to the Word of God. So they're going to see it lived out and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And number three, declaring the Word of God, witnessing, going on the mission field like Lynn's going to be going uh, here soon. 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Thanks for reading that this morning, Mike. A holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Notice it's so that you can proclaim the excellencies of God. That's declaring. That's using your voice to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and hurting world. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, has been reported to say, I share the gospel or share the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. But it's always necessary because some of the best people I know are Mormon and their gospel is different than our gospel. But they're good people. It is always necessary to say, if there is anything good in me, that's the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ working in and through me. To you, declaring the gospel, we must proclaim. Why? Acts twenty six eighteen, so that their eyes will be opened, and that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the dominion of Satan attributed to darkness to God, and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, Jesus. Uh, Romans 10, 13, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love that. Man, whoever runs to the Lord, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's anyone. Verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, literally the gospel of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We need to shine our light. How do we do that? Three things. Who remembers what they were? Hear the word, obey the word, proclaim the word. 
We have to use our words. So how do people hear? Uh, how are most people saved? The Institute for American Church Growth asked 10,000 people uh, this question. What was responsible for you coming to Christ? And here's their responses. I attended a revival service like Harvest or Billy Graham Crusade. See the percentage up there? 0.005%. All right. I visited a church, 1%. I had a special need, 2%. I just walked into church, 3%. I liked the programs, 3%. I liked the Sunday school, 5%. I like the minister, 6%. One-to-one evangelism, 79.995% of people in this survey came to the Lord from somebody sharing the gospel, shining their light to them. We need to be about our Father's business. We, uh, one-to-one evangelism is imperative, yet most Christians never do it. They don't practice it. We have one commission. It is how you live, not simply activities you do. So we used to do evangelism every Friday night, and we would go to the Spectrum, or we would go to, uh, you know, some place where there's a lot of people and street witness to people. Um, And then a lot of people would say, well, hey, man, I did my evangelism for the week. Now I don't have to do it the rest of the week. Friday nights is when I evangelize. The rest of the time, I don't. Folks, every day, all day, we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ to a lost and hurting world, and we need to share the light and love of Jesus with a lost world. In fact, the whole reason we get the Holy Spirit is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even the remotest parts of the earth. So back to the first verse of the text, Luke eleven thirty three. No one after lighting a lamp, is that lamp still okay? Oh, good, we're not lighting a fire or anything. That's good. <laughs> Puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. So then how should we live, being empowered by the Spirit, shining the light and love of Jesus to a dark and hurting world? It's truly about going and making disciples everywhere we go, looking for opportunities to share. So what's our commission? We only have one, Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make converts. No, make what? Disciples. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We make disciples. Many people, though, teach we should all have one person we're discipling and one person we're being discipled by. Have you ever heard that? Okay. So I believe we should be discipling everyone we can. Every interaction is a chance to disciple or make a disciple or encourage a disciple. Making disciples, there's really three groups. Our commission is the first group, declaring the gospel to the lost, reproving them, showing them the error of not believing. The second group is rebuking or correcting those with false beliefs or practice. And the third group is exhorting or encouraging those who are truly born again and walking with Jesus. And it's interesting. Well, anyway, uh, it takes real love and courage to do that, right? It does take courage to share your faith. (laughs) Every time I do it, the Holy Spirit will say, go tell that person I love him. I'm like, "Uh, really, God? I'm kind of late for something. I, I don't feel like it right now. But you never know how that could change the course of their life. To be faithful, be courageous in sharing forth the love of Jesus Christ. Perfect love is real courage. That's how a man can protect his wife and children and even give his life because he loves them. Folks, we need to have a heart for the lost. We need to have a heart for the hurting so we have the courage Because it's love that gives us the courage to go up to them and say, man, how's your faith journey? Where are you at with God? 
What's your belief system? What do you believe about God? Man, God is real, and he loves you. And Jesus paid for all of your sin on the cross. And if you put your faith in him, you're forgiven, cleansed, and you will have the God of the universe on your side to go through every challenge you face in life. We have to love them. 1 John 4.14 says, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also we are in the world. There is no, what, is, what does that say up there? Fear in love. Because perfect love casts out fear. Every time I don't want to speak to somebody about Jesus, <laughs> I just, I'm afraid, I, I just, oh, they're just going to reject it, or whatever the fear is, it's, I, I kind of remind myself of this verse or the Holy Spirit does, you don't really love them. And the mark of a Christian, if there's one thing, is love. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the the church family as Christ loves us. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And even love your enemy. They're in darkness And if we cared about their eternal soul, we would not let fear stop us from sharing truth. Amen? We need to be about our Father's business. Confession is proclamation. 1 Corinthians, 1 Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him admonishing every man, everyone they, they meet teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. We do it by Acts 1.8. We already read it. I love the Phillips translation of that. So naturally, we proclaim Christ. We warn every man we meet and teach everyone we can all that we know about him so that if possible, we may bring every man up to his full maturity in Christ Jesus. This is what I am working at all the time with all my strength that God gives me. I believe that captures how we should be every day, all day. Proclaiming involves three things. 2 Timothy 4.1, solemn, I, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. That's all the time. Reprove, that's someone who's an unbeliever. Rebuke, that's someone who claims to be a believer, but they have false Uh, theology or false practice. Exhort, that's a born-again believer who needs encouraged and exhorted. The three groups. That is how we make disciples. We should be discipling everyone we can. All day, every day. This is how we make followers of Jesus and his word, real disciples. Paul tells us this is to be done naturally, the goal is to uh, making disciples, the three groups, warn, reprove, evangelism, apologetics, rebuke, teach, correction, and proclaiming the truth, exhort, encouragement, born-again believers. We should be doing that all the time. That is what is most important in the lives of a born-again Christian. The subject is Jesus Christ. The end result is a transformed life and true disciples, and the calling is a full-time responsibility. Worship team, come on up.
I'm, I'm skipping a lot. The rest is for me. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What is that? My computer's like... Eh. So it does take hard work to witness and disciple. Philippians 2, 13 through 15 says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you think God loves it when you witness, when you share your faith? Absolutely. There is a party in heaven, the Bible says, when one sinner converts. All the angels are watching. You know, you're, you're in the grocery store and you see that person over there and the Holy Spirit kind of prompts you. You need to go pray for them. You need to go tell them that I love them. And you're debating in your mind, can you imagine how the angels in heaven are like, come on, Brett, go do it. Go do it. Come on. Come on. And then you're walking up and the angels are like, he's going. He's going. The Holy Spirit's like, I'm working on their heart right now. Okay, their, their heart, they're ready. The harvest is ready. But where are the workers? I'll pray for workers to go out to a lost and hurting world. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, verse 15, Philippians 2, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights to the world. Let's shine, right? Ah, God loves you so much. And he's looking for people to use. People that he can speak through and demonstrate his light and love to a lost and hurting world. I want to be that kind of person. That should be all of our desires and our hearts. Amen. God bless you. Why don't you stand? I, lo I love that picture with that, that light just shining out into the darkness. It's so cool because it'll just keep going. Like that star that's 28 billion light years away. Wow. And a light year, by the way, is how long it takes light to travel for a year. So the light from our sun gets here in eight minutes. So the light from our sun, a year, what it would take would be way beyond our solar system. And 28 billion light years, I, we can't even fathom how far that is. And we can see the light from that. Wow. Oh, Father God, I pray that you would so anoint us with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would lead us and guide us, that we would shine brightly your love and your grace and your mercy to a lost and hurting world. Lord, give us the words, give us the courage to be ambassadors of your heavenly kingdom. And God, help us to not hide our light under a bushel, but Lord, help us to put it on the stand that all who see us sees your light shining bright in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this song to the Lord.
let's eat some let's eat some loaded baked potatoes. Amen. Baked potatoes. Baked. I like the accent. I like the accent.